Let's turn back over to Romans chapter 6. I covered two verses last night. I quoted a hundred, but we covered two here in Romans chapter 6. If you missed any of last night, I encourage you to please get that message. Uh, Jamie said it was good. Jamie doesn't give out compliments very often. So man, it was, I believe it was really good last night. Amen. So uh, you ought to get that. Praise God. So uh, anyway, I started off with Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul had taught on the grace of God so effectively that it led to this question. Can you just live in sin because God is not dealing with you based on your performance? And absolutely not. Verse 2 says, God forbid... No, that's not what he's saying, but that is a logical question. If the place that you go to church never preaches on the grace of God to such a degree that people think, well, man, can I just live in sin? Then you hadn't heard the gospel that Paul preached because he had to deal with this four different times. Anytime the true gospel is preached, people are going to say, you're giving a license to people for sin. No, that's not what Gary says, but... Uh, that's what people think when you start preaching about that God loves you because he is love and not because you are lovely. And uh, so that is something you have to deal with. So he says, God forbid. And then he gives you the reason why you don't live in sin because uh, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And this is what I got stuck on talking about last night. Again, I'd encourage you to get that. Even if you heard it, you ought to get this and go back over it. You are dead to sin. You aren't dying to sin. You are dead. Past tense. It's done. You know, Dwayne Sheriff is a friend of mine and he's one of the instructors in our Bible college. He's on my board of directors and he travels with me to England every year and ministers. And he was teaching on this last uh, June and it was funny. He was talking about people believe that they are in the process of dying to sin. And he started going through the motions of what it's like to die. But then he says, no, you're dead. And he just died. He fell right on the platform. I'm not going to do that today, but he <laughs> fell on the ground and he preached the rest of his message laying on the ground. <laughs> it really made a point. But there is a difference between dying and dead. You are dead to sin. You aren't dying. You are dead. And I put that together with 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, where whosoever is born of God cannot commit sin. Cannot, not should not, not does not, but cannot. It is impossible if you are born of God to commit sin. How do you understand that? Because in the same passage of Scripture, 1 John it says, my little children, talking about Christians, these things have I written unto you that you sin not. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. In that same epistle, the apostle John said that Christians can sin. And that yet he said, but whatsoever is born of God cannot sin. The way that you understand this is your spirit is the only part of you that is born of God. Your body is not born again. Your soul isn't saved. We will often use that terminology and says, man, I believe in being a soul winner. There, the scripture twice that I can mention, once in Daniel and once in Hebrews, talks about soul salvation. But that's talking about your emotional, mental part of you when you get delivered from depression, discouragement and stuff. But when you get born again, it's not your soul that gets saved. It's your spirit that gets born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You can tell that's not talking about your body because your body doesn't instantly change. It's not talking about your mind and your emotions. Now it's subject to change, but it doesn't instantly change. Your spirit is a part of you that's changed. So when this says that we are dead to sin, your born again person is incapable of sin. And somebody says, well, but the problem is I still have that old nature. And people have described this like there's a white dog and a black dog inside of you and they're constantly fighting one against another. And which one wins? The one that you feed the most. You got to feed your new nature instead of your old nature. I'm going to say some things to you here that are radical, things that you may not have heard before. 
Like, did you, did you know that based on this passage of scripture that Paul revealed that his father was one of the thieves on the cross? It says right here that his old man was crucified with Christ, amen. <laughs> Radical stuff, amen. Look at this in verse three. He says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now y'all quit laughing and listen to this. All right, verse three. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. You know the word baptism here, people get all weird with baptism and they always think of water baptism. The scripture, scripture mentions plural, many baptisms. For instance, over in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 it says, let's quit laying the same foundation of baptisms, plural. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, by one spirit, you were all baptized into the body of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit is the agent baptizing you into the body of Christ. But then uh, John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter three and Luke chapter three, that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So Jesus is now the baptizer and you are being baptized into the Holy Spirit. So those are two different baptisms. Then there's water baptism. So anyway, the point I'm making is when you use this word baptize, the word baptize is literally, it's a transliteration of a Greek word, baptizo. And the word baptize or baptizo literally means to submerge. And yet when the King James Bible was translated, they sprinkled. They didn't submerge people. So rather than translate something that would ruin their doctrines, they just transliterated it so that nobody really knew exactly what it meant. But you have to immerse a person to baptize them. For instance, it says Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water. I can guarantee you that wasn't some little baptismal font that he came up out of. He came out of the river. You can't baptize scripturally with just sprinkling. You got to submerge a person. People say, do you believe in sprinkling or, or immersion? I believe in just holding them under until they really repent, praise God. <laughs> So this is just talking about that when you got born again, you were baptized into Christ's death. You were immersed in Christ's death. You became a part of Christ's death. And look at this in verse four. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. Again, this water baptism is a picture of this, but it is through the baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ that this is talking about. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, and verses two, three, and four say that we were, we were baptized. So if you are born again, you have been planted in the likeness of his death. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice there's a colon there. This is not a period. It's not the end of the sentence. They made a verse division for the purpose of reference and that's okay, but you've got to read it in its context, read the entire statement in order to get this. So we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. You're, you manifesting the resurrection life of Jesus is dependent upon you knowing this. If you don't know this, you cannot release his resurrection power. So you have to know this, that our old man is crucified with him. And if you look all of these words up in the Greek and then look at the aortist and all of these different tents and things like this, this is just talking about that our old man has been, it's already done, crucified. You are not dying to your old man. You are not in the process. You know, I was raised in a church that taught that you had to die to yourself daily. 
And some people will say, well, isn't that scripture? Well, there is a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul said, I die daily. But if you read it in context, he was talking about people who were saying that there is no suffering in this life. And he says, man, what do you mean there's no suffering? I've been, you know, fought with beast at Ephesus. I've been mocked. I've been stoned. I've had all of these. I die daily. That isn't talking about that he was dying to himself daily. It was talking about that he was facing death on a continual basis. And he goes on to say, if in this life we only have hope, we are of all men most miserable. He was talking about what Greg was preaching about heaven. And man, heaven is so great that it's worth all of the things that we have to endure in this life because we're going to be compensated big time in heaven for anything that you put up with. He wasn't talking about that he died to himself daily. I was raised in this church that taught that you had to die to yourself daily. And honestly, I heard a message on this. And when I was a kid, I would imagine myself sitting in a, an electric chair. <laughs> and every morning I'd get up and strap myself in and I'd mention pride and unforgiveness and I'd name all of my sins and I'd strap myself and oh Jesus, I just died to myself. <laughs> I did that. I was taught to do that. It was a message that I heard. <laughs> but you know what I was doing? I was resurrecting self every day. I was, I was magnifying self. I was amplifying self. I was focused on self and thinking about how sorry and how ungodly I were. And basically, this is the way that most of religion is. They think that you, if they just preach on how bad you are and what a mess you are, that you'll get sick of yourself and somehow or another just vomit it up and quit being so self-centered. It's just the opposite. Focusing on yourself just makes you more self-centered. This is not saying that you have to just daily die. It says you have to know this, that your old man is crucified. It is dead. And here's some of those radical statements. You don't have an old man. You do not have an old man. Somebody said, I can guarantee you I do. Mine resurrects daily. See, you're imputing resurrection power to that carnal self, that old self, and that is not true. You do not have an old man. Or the NIV will say sinful nature over in Romans chapter 8. If I can talk fast enough, we may get to Romans chapter 8 sometime before this weekend's over. But it, it uses sinful nature. You don't have a sinful nature. You did have a sinful nature. Before you were born again, all of us were servants to sin. All of us were uh, conceived in sin is what David said. And that wasn't talking about his mother was in an adulterous relationship. It just means that all of us were born with a sin nature. You were born separated from God. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The spirit of disobedience worked in our hearts. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is evil and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That is the state of man before they get born again. I could really spend an hour on this because our society has lost this. And today people are preaching that people are basically good. Everybody's really basically good. If we could just sit down and all talk at a table and sing Kumbaya, we would all be able to come into agreement. And that's not true. People are evil at their core and they've got to be born again. And only when you get born again does that nature change. But once you get born again, you get this new man and your old man is dead. It says, let me go back and read again, verse five. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, which we have, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, knowing that your old man is dead. There is no nature. That's what your old man term is talking about. You had a sinful nature on the inside of you that compelled you to sin. I wish I had time to share all of this, but Romans chapter seven, I don't know if I'll get into that, but Romans chapter seven shows that you were alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. Man, I'm saying some things here. I wished I had time to explain this. Let me just say something. You know, the word sin or sins, plural, is used 49 times in the book of Romans. 
Out of those 49 times, there are three Greek words that are used. In Romans 3.25, one word. Yeah, I'm not going to try and pronounce it because I'm not very good at Greek. I know a little bit of Greek, a little, a little Greek, a little Hebrew. One has a laundromat and the other one a restaurant. And, uh, <laughs> but I can't pronounce those words. But anyway, this one word was used in Romans 3.25. And then there is one word, one Greek word that is used in Romans chapter 6 and in verse 15. But outside of those two, the other 47 uh, times that the word sin or sins is translated, it's translated from this one Greek word that is a noun. Now that's important because a noun describes a person, place, or thing, whereas a verb describes an action. The Greek word that was translated here in Romans 6, 15, where it says, what then, shall we sin? That's talking about an action, that's a verb. But every other time the word sin or sins is used, except that Romans 3, 25, but the other 47 times, it's a noun describing a person, place, or thing, not an action. Now that's significant because most people when they read this about how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it, they are thinking about actions. You mean I can't sin? I can't do something wrong? That's a verb. No, you are dead to sin, the noun. You are dead to that sin nature is what this is talking about. Most people miss this. You can commit sins but your sin nature is dead. There is nothing compelling you to sin anymore. Before you got born again, the reason you sinned was because it was your nature to sin. Most people think, well, I did this and this made me a sinner. No, you did that because you were already a sinner. You were born a sinner. You were born with the fallen nature. You know, little children, when they're born, we talk about how sweet they are, and they are sweet and all of that, but you know what? You don't have to teach a baby to be selfish and to fight and to take things from other people and stuff. They have a sin nature. You leave a child to itself, and I guarantee you that child will wind up living in sin and being selfish and doing things. That is the nature of every single one of us. We were all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And you were born with a sin nature. But when you got born again, that sin nature was crucified. Your old man, that sinful nature is crucified. You do not have a sinful nature anymore. And somebody says, well, if I don't have a sinful nature, why is it that I am so drawn towards sin? How come it is that I, I, I'd like sin? How come I thought I had a sinful nature in me? No, you're, if you're born again, your sinful nature is gone. Look at this again in verse 6. You have to know this, that your old man is crucified with him. Then the next thing, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Then the result of that is that henceforth we should not serve sin. And again, this sin is not talking about the action of sin, but this sinful nature, this old sinful nature. So here's what happened. Your old man is crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed. You know, when a person dies, their spirit and soul leaves their body. You can see that because in uh, Revelation chapter 6, he saw the souls of them which were slain for the witness of the Lord. So their soul was in heaven. And in uh, James chapter 2, verse 26, it says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So you put those scriptures together. Your soul and your spirit leave your body when you die. But it leaves behind a body. And did you know it takes a period of time for your body to decay? Matter of fact, I've actually seen dead people who look like they were alive. I was praying over a dead person one time. I thought they were alive. I thought they were asleep and they were dead. I had a friend that was in Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and he did an autopsy. He, he did autopsies and he pulled this body out of a slab 
and put it on a table. And he turned around to get some of his tools to do the autopsy. And when he turned around, this corpse was sitting up and its arms were dangling like that and his mouth was open and his eyes were open. This guy said he nearly jumped out of the 13th floor window. He went running down the hall screaming and saying, help. And they came back and they checked this guy out and he was dead. But you still have these electrical impulses that can run through your body and it can make a muscle contract. And this guy sat up even though he was dead. He, you know, people can twitch and things like this. When you die, when your spirit and soul leaves the body, you leave, be, I mean, leaves, leaves the body, it leaves behind that body and it takes time for that body to deteriorate and turn back to dust. So this is saying that your old man is crucified, that the body that was left behind should be destroyed. What is that talking about? Your old man programmed this mind, how to think and how to act. Before you got born again, you had a sinful nature that taught you to be selfish. You know this old story about how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? With most people, it's just one. Because you just stand there and hold it and the whole world revolves around you. <laughs> It'll just automatically. That's the way that most people live. It's all about me. When you're a little baby, you don't care that your mother's been up all night long giving birth or anything. You'll wake up everybody in the house. You could bring a baby into this auditorium and it doesn't care if there's thousands of people in here wanting to hear the word. Man, it'll just cry. It'll scream. It doesn't know that anybody exists but them. Your old man taught you that you are the center of the universe and it's all about you. And because of that, Proverbs 13, 10, many other places, it says only by pride comes contention. The middle letter of pride is I. Sin, the middle letter of sin is I. Sin, everything is all around self-centeredness, all around you. If you loved other people more than you loved yourself, you'd never steal You'd never be angry. You'd never criticize them. You wouldn't say things. You wouldn't murder. You wouldn't do these things if you loved other people more than you love yourself. All sin is based around I. It's all self-centered. It's all about you. And your old nature taught you that you are the center of the universe. Take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, nobody else will, which is absolutely untrue. If you would put God first, seek first the kingdom of God, he would take care of you better than you've ever taken care of yourself. But our old sinful nature left behind a body in wrong thoughts, attitudes, values, hurts and pains, uh, all kinds of things. Your identity. There are many of you that see yourself as a drunk, see yourself as a doper. I was talking to somebody this morning who has a family member that is bipolar and uh, they were asking me to pray. And I've, I've got this lady, uh, Nicole Marbach, who is a graduate of our school up in um, Chicago. And she just recently wrote a book and asked me to read it and I wrote a forward for it. And it's, it's still in the process, it's not out yet, but it was awesome. This woman was bipolar, manic depressive, uh, ADD, PTSD. She had every label that you could put on her. She cut herself. She was in so much emotional pain that she said it was actually good. It felt good to feel physical pain because it was easier to deal with than the emotional pain. So she cut herself, tried to commit suicide many times, carved on her stomach, I hate me with a razor blade. And she was just a mess. And you know what set her free? is that she, she had been to the doctor and she went through a bunch of rehab things where she went in and out of these rehab deals and she thought that that was her. She thought that this is who she was and she had to learn to live with it. She adjusted her life around trying to be a manic depressive and all of these things. And all of a sudden she found out who she was in Christ and she just said, that's not me. And she became this new person that she was and she was instantly delivered. And today she's got her own ministry. She's traveling, preaching the gospel and just seeing great things happening and writing books about how Jesus set her free. It's awesome. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
But in that book, she made it very clear that she thought that was her. She had to deal with it. She had to face that this is who she was and live her life that way. You don't. That is not you. And I don't care what's happened to you in the past. That is not you. You are a brand new person. That old person that, that taught you all of this stuff, it is dead. It is gone. It doesn't exist. The only reason that you still have some of those attitudes and some of these problems is because you haven't renewed your mind. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The truth is your spirit has already been changed. It is completely changed. You are perfect. You are identical to Jesus in your spirit. Your spirit is great. And that is the real you. The real you is your spirit. But it has a soul and it lives in a body. Your three parts but the real you is this spirit. And if you can understand this and recognize that the old man that taught you all of these wrong things and led you to do this, it's gone. And now all that's left behind is this unrenewed mind. That's the reason the Bible says you get transformed. The Greek word for transform there is metamorpho. It's a word we get metamorphosis from where it talks about a caterpillar spins a cocoon and comes out a butterfly. If you want to be changed from something that is earthbound and ugly to something that can fly and is beautiful, if you want transformation, you do it by the renewing of your mind. Your spirit's already complete, but you've got to renew your mind to it. Man, that is powerful right there. Your mind is very similar to a computer. It can be programmed. And the sad fact is, every one of us was programmed by this old man, by that sinful nature. Every one of us was taught to be selfish and to operate in fear and to operate in unbelief. You were programmed that way. Now that you got born again, you got a brand new nature. You are completely transformed on the inside but you will function the way you were programmed. If you continue to think the same way, if you say, well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, if that's the way you think, then you'll act like an old sinner. But the truth is I'm not an old sinner. I got saved by grace and now I am the righteousness of God. My spirit is holy and pure. And in my spirit, I'm awesome. I'm identical to Jesus. I used that verse last night, 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the future world. In the spirit realm, your spirit's as perfect, as saved, as pure, as holy right this second as it will ever be in eternity. Your spirit doesn't have to grow and get more complete and get more knowledge. You aren't trying to educate your spirit. The scripture says that in your spirit, you already have the mind of Christ. You know all things, 1 John 2, 20. Your spirit is complete. We are in the process of trying to change your thinking this weekend. We're speaking to your mind. We're trying to get the word into your brain. Hey, man, your spirit already knows all things. It already has the mind of Christ. Your three parts, spirit, soul, and body. If you get your soul in agreement with your spirit, that's two against one. And you know what? Your body has to release and manifest the supernatural power of God. But if your soul doesn't know this, that that old man is gone and that you are a new person, the body has been destroyed. If you don't know that and instead you're saying, oh, but I feel sick. The doctor says I'm sick. The banker says I'm poor. And you, if you are going by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, if your soul is in agreement with your body, it will completely shut off the flow of this new life that you have in Christ. So going back to Romans chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, For if ye have been planted together in the likeness of his death, which we have, we are crucified with him. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, this unrenewed mind, might be destroyed, and then 
That means that you will not serve sin. You will not be a slave is what this is talking about. There are people that are slaves to sin. And again, this isn't just talking about the actions of sin, but this propensity for sin, this desire for sin, the thing that was left over from your old sinful nature. There are people that are bound to that because that's who they see themselves. And I hate to say this because I'll get criticism. I always do. But you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. So anyway, don't get mad at me, but this is why I don't like the 12-step programs, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, al Non, and stuff like that. I know that there's probably somebody in here who's been blessed by that, and it's helped you. And I admit that it can help people to a degree. But the thing that I think is wrong with it, I've been to those meetings. I've taken people who were alcoholics to these meetings, and they start by saying, hello, my name is Andrew, and I've been an alcoholic for 20 years, but I've been sober for two. But you identify as an alcoholic. And they will say, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. I'm only one drink away from being an alcoholic again. That is your identity. And did you know that that can help you to a degree but it's not what Jesus was talking about. Once you get born again, you aren't an alcoholic. Your entire nature is changed. And instead of seeing yourself as I'm still an alcoholic, no, I am now a brand new person. And if you could ever see that and change your identity, that dominion would be broken over you. You have been programmed to have a lust for that. You've been programmed to feel like you are dependent upon this by that old nature. When you got born again, if you could see yourself, I am dead to that. That is not me anymore. It would transform you. You know, I heard Kenneth Hagin on a tape one time talk about that if he ever had a natural talent or ability, he said it was the ability to pick a lock. He never saw a lock that he couldn't pick. And so when he got born again, uh, all of his friends were used to using him to pick the locks, to break into things. And he got born again and they came to him just a few days later and asked him to do it. And he says, I can't do it. And they said, what do you mean? You can pick any lock. And he says, no, I'm a new man. And he just knew that he had changed and he no longer had that ability. I mean, he was so transformed. His identity changed from being a crook and picking locks and doing things to where he says, I just can't do it. Would to God every one of us could be like that. The truth is you are a brand new person. And I said this last night, but some of you, when you get to heaven, you aren't going to know yourself because you think you know yourself, but you know yourself. You're an angry person. You're a bitter person. You're a depressed person. You're a, a weak person. You're an insecure person. And this is your identity and that's how you see yourself. But you know what? That is not the born again you. And that carnal self, this flesh part of you is not going to heaven. And when you get to heaven, you aren't going to know yourself. But the truth is you are awesome. You are identical to Jesus right now. Everything that's true of Jesus is true of you. And the way to overcome sin, it says that we should, henceforth should not serve sin. The way to overcome sin isn't by an old oh, Jesus. I just, I lust. I'm an adulterer. That's what I really like in my heart. I hate to admit it, but I am. Please help me to deal with this. That's the wrong way. The right way is to say, Father, thank you that I was an adulterer, but man, I have been set for, I am a new person and I know that in my spirit, there is nothing but God's kind of love, joy and peace and all of these things. And you change your identity and say, this is who I am. What we've been doing in church is preaching to the flesh, to the carnal part of people, telling them how to cope and manage and deal with sin and giving them 12-step programs and different things to cope and to manage when the whole thing could be dealt with if people just understood, I'm dead to sin. I'm a new person. And what's this new person like? You just go to the Word and find out. It's identical to Jesus. Whatever Jesus is, that's the way you are in your spirit. You know, I had a friend in Chicago 
that was raised in a home where his parents were alcoholics and they just stayed drunk the whole time. And so from the time he was a little kid, he was an alcoholic. He had drug problems and stuff and, and they didn't even clothe him. He would run around naked or with underwear on. And he skipped school and, and the truant officers had come get him and buy him some clothes and put him in school and he'd wear them until they got dirty. But his parents were alcoholics. They would never take care of him. And so he'd only go to school for a week at a time or something like that. And then he just was, he was a doper and a drunk. And by the time he was 17 or 18, he was in a mental institution. He had fried his brain and he was doing tiles, uh, gluing tiles together and going through all this stuff. And anyway, somebody came through, preached the gospel and this guy got born again. And it was awesome. But then he asked the guy that led him to the Lord. He says, who am I? Because he'd either been drunk or high his whole life. He didn't remember. He didn't know anything. He didn't have a childhood. He didn't go to school. He knew nothing. He didn't have an identity. He'd been stoned his whole life. And he didn't know who he was. And so the guy who led him to the Lord had enough sense to say, just read the Bible and find out who Jesus is and that's who you are and start acting like him. And because of this, when I first met this guy, I told Jamie, I said, keep your hand on your wallet. <laughs> I said, this guy is too nice. He's too kind. I said, he's after something. And after he had bought us a, like a dozen cars and he'd given us $300,000, I figured out he was never going to get out of me more than he had given to me and I could probably trust him. And I finally had to let down my guard. But I mean, this guy was too nice. And the reason was because he didn't have a past identity. He just got born again and decided he'd try and be like Jesus. Would to God every one of us could be like that. I wish somehow or another we could just erase our memories and lose our past so that we could just say, who am I? And you know, in the Bible, they'd change their name. They'd literally change their names and take on a new identity. Every one of us need to do this. This goes right along with what Greg's teaching that, man, it doesn't matter what your past is, what Jesus has done for you, who you are in Christ is so much greater than what other problems that you've had that you need to quit magnifying them. You know, the Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Psalms chapter 34. The word magnify means to make bigger. The problem is your mind is like a magnifying glass and whatever you focus on gets bigger. And most of us are focused on our problems, focused on our hurts, focused on our past, focused on our mistakes instead of focused on what Jesus has done. This lady I was telling you about, Nicole Marbach, the moment she saw what Jesus had done and realized she was a new creature, she changed identity and she has never cut herself. She has never been manic depressive. She's never had ADD. She's never been, had PTSD since then. And the truth is every person who's born again doesn't have those things in your spirit. It just depends whether you're going to live by who you are in Christ or if you're going to live in this outer person. Man, that's awesome. The, pro the only problem with this is, see your three parts. You aren't only a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body and you cannot just totally divorce yourself from your body and your soul. But your identity needs to be in who you are in Christ and you from your spirit need to rule over your soul and over your body. You know, I, your imagination, if, I don't know if this will work for you or not, but just imagine that this big auditorium right here is divided into three sections. So that section over there is your body. And that section over there is where people have the ability to come and, and fight against you. Sickness and things like that are over there. In the center would be your soul. And that's like the master control. If you could imagine maybe, you know, some kind of a desk up there and all of these computers and controls because your soul is what controls you. But then over here on this other part is your spirit. And that spirit is a pure place. It's sealed. If you could imagine like, uh, you know, again, um, if you could think of, uh, I guess it's Star Trek that has these holodecks that, you know, you can make anything you want to out of this. In your spirit, it's perfect. What's your spirit like? 
Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance. There is no hurt. There is no pain. There is no sorrow. Everything is perfect and it's completely sealed so that nothing can penetrate that seal. It never fluctuates. Anytime that you are depressed or discouraged, you're in the soulish realm. That's right. And you are looking over here. It's what's happening. Imagine that your body over there has all of these windows around it and you can see all of the stuff that's happening in the world and you see other people with problems and just all of this stuff. Your soul is focused on that. But if your soul is focused over here on who you are in Christ, there is no reason for you not to have joy, not to have peace. God has already done everything. It's complete. Amen. Did you know that your spirit is like Jesus? Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus is meek. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh and yet he is meek and lowly. He is not arrogant. He's not proud. So you know what? If you are arrogant or proud, you aren't living out of who you are in Christ. That's your old nature. If you're insecure and it, you're just fearful that something's always going to go wrong. You know, there's many of you that God has done something awesome in your life and you've got things that could bless people. I've had, what, four or five, maybe more people up here giving testimonies already. And God has done great things in your life. But if I was to call on you and ask you to come up here and share, you'd freeze because you're insecure. What's everybody going to think of me? That's, you aren't living in your spirit. That's your soul. Your soul is a part of you that's insecure and that's hurt and that has these problems. In your spirit realm, it is perfect. There is nothing wrong. And yet many of you have an identity that it, you know it's contrary to what Jesus is, but you feel like that's just me. It is just you. It's not the born again you. You're carnal. It's the soulish part of you. So really all of our problem comes down to an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. Greg was making reference to this. People can't even figure out which bathroom to go in. <laughs> Man, if you can't figure out if you're a male or a female, you got an identity crisis. All you got to do is check your plumbing and whatever plumbing, whatever plumbing God gave you, that's who you are. And I don't care what you feel like. Amen. We've got an identity crisis. People don't know who they are. And some of well, but I've been abused my whole life. You don't know. And you're magnifying that instead of magnifying who you are in Christ. I actually ministered in Lima, Ohio, and I was talking along these lines. This has been 30 years ago. And I had a woman come up. She was about 22 years old. And she just hugged me and she says, thank you. Thank you for saying this. And I said, what's your story? And when she was 14... She was raised in a home where the grandfather lived in the home and the grandfather sexually abused her every day of her life until she was 12 or 13 years old. When she was 14, she got born again. And when she got born again, she told her parents what had happened. And they got so mad at their dad that they kicked him out of the house and they put her in therapy. But when she got born again... She totally forgave her granddad. It was like she just got set free and there wasn't any bitterness. She didn't have any psychological problems because she was born again. And she really was so thankful that the Lord had set her free. That's the reason she finally shared is because she, she got set free. And her family got mad at her. The Christian therapist got mad at her. And they actually kicked her out of the home when she was 16 years old. And she was out on her own because she was in denial. She wouldn't admit that she had all of these emotional problems. And she came to me and she says, thank you for saying that Jesus could set you free and you don't have to have all of these problems. And yet most Christians today, I guarantee you, this psychology has entered in so that we feel like that if something bad has happened to you, you have to go through this grieving process. You have to have all of these things. You have to limp through life 
with all of these problems. And I'm telling you, it's not so. Now, am I denying that you have a physical body and that you have a soul that has been hurt and scarred? No, but I'm saying that what you've received in the spirit is so much greater than what you've experienced in the flesh that if you would magnify that and stand on who you are in Christ Jesus, it would overwhelm all of the physical and emotional things that you feel. And yet the average Christian is coping and dealing with things rather than changing this identity and saying, in Christ, this is not who I am. You know, I was an introvert. I couldn't look at a person in the face. I couldn't say hi to a stranger. Now, if, if I got to know you, I could become comfortable with you. But if it was a stranger walking down the street, I remember a senior in high school that somebody walked by and said, good morning. And they were two blocks down the street and I was sitting in my car before I could say good morning. And I sat in that car thinking, what's wrong with me? But I was just so introverted. A lot of it had to do with religion. And I'd just been taught and I had such a condemned attitude and stuff. That is who I was in the natural. And now I speak to millions and millions and millions of people and I love being around people. And God has changed my life. And you know how it happened? Because I started magnifying who I was in Christ. When I found out who I was in Christ, I found out Jesus isn't uh, timid and shy. He's not introverted. Jesus isn't insecure. I know people that are afraid of heights. We took a cable car up to Masada and this woman was laying on the floor just all she could do to force herself to go up there. Jesus didn't like that. If you're like that, it's because you aren't letting Jesus live in you. You are walking in your flesh. That is your personality. That is not your born again personality. If you're a person that's just bitter and mean and short and you cut everybody off, you say, well, that's just the way my family is. No, it's just the way the devil is. <laughs> and that's the way that the devil taught your family and you're blaming it on your genes. The problem is not in your genes. Well, it might be in your jeans. You're wearing those jeans. <laughs> but it's not your hormones or genetics. It's, man, you are a new person. And whatever our weaknesses and things are, we ought to go to Jesus and say, and put that up against Jesus. Is this the way that Jesus would act in this situation? Is this the way he would think? Is this the way he would respond to criticism? How did he respond to people that mocked him and spit in his face and pulled his beard and said, prophesy if you're the Christ? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And yet you're angry and bitter and you're scheming. How can I get even? How can I hurt them back? That's not Jesus. That's your flesh. This is really how simple the Christian life is. You're a new person in Christ. In the spirit, you're identical to Jesus. And the scripture says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you walk in the spirit? That's not having your hands folded like this. That's not turning your collar around backwards. If your collar's around backwards, you're going in the wrong direction. That's not having this sick look on your face and somehow or another looking spooky, weird, and holy. Walking in the Spirit is just, what does the Word say? Who are you? What do you have? You can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You can do the same works that Jesus did. That's walking in the Spirit. And if you don't feel like that, well, then your feelings are wrong. But today we've glorified feelings to the point that, well, I know what the Word says, but I just don't feel it. Well, pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. Amen. You know, there's times you don't feel like going to work, but part of being an adult is you just drag yourself out of bed and you go to work because you know you got to do it. You need to get beyond your feelings. There's times I don't feel like preaching, but that's what God called me to do. And I just do what God told me to do. I lost my desire to travel 10 years ago. Man, I've traveled so much. The first 50 trips across the Atlantic were fun. But man, it hadn't been fun in decades. But you know what? I just do what I got to do. Travel is tough. 
it, some of you don't understand that, but travel is tough. When Greg was talking about going to Hawaii, not me. I go to Cancun because it's in the same time zone and it's three hours instead of eight or whatever. Man, I just am, I'm tired of traveling. So, but you know what? I do what I'm supposed to do. I don't always feel like it. That's part of growing up. And spiritually speaking, you know what? You may not feel like you can lay hands on the sick, but the Bible says you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You may not feel like always studying the word, but do it. You may not feel like forgiving that person, but the Lord gives you a command. Be kind, tenderhearted one towards another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You're commanded to do it. You're commanded to forgive. Well, I don't feel like forgiving them. Well, then your feelings are wrong. You're in the flesh. In Romans chapter eight, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The flesh is contrary to the spirit. The spirit is contrary to the flesh. The flesh is your, the residual old man, this part of the old man, the old nature, that, the body that was left behind. And you've got to deny your flesh and get to where I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what my body feels like. Here's what the Word of God says about me and body, you will respond. Most people let the body and their feelings control them and lead them around, but I have a pain in my body. Who cares? Amen. You know, I, got, I, I was playing golf out in uh, Florida and I didn't use any sunscreen. And I got this big old blister on my ear and that thing bubbled up. It was a big thing and I got tired of it. And so I just ripped the thing off. And that was in uh, December of 2008 because in January of 2009, I went with Derry and Karen to Nicaragua. And I remember this thing, it just didn't heal. It was and I, I've never gone to a doctor, but I've got doctors that are on my board and they would get me and examine me and they say, this is a cancer, this is a melanoma. And you know what? I had it for six years and it got worse and I bled all over places. I went and spent the night with James and Betty Robinson and bled all over their pillows. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I just, I, it was my fault that it lasted as long as it did because the truth was I wasn't that concerned about it. I didn't have to look at it. Everybody else had to see it. <laughs> you know, you don't really look at your ear much when you're looking in the mirror and I could comb my hair and I never had to look at it. So anyways, I'm sure it was my fault. But anyway, I just stuck with it. And after six years, that thing's finally gone. I'm healed up. I'm healthy as a horse. But you know what? I just refuse to let what I see or what I felt dominate me. And yet most people, man, immediately you'd panic. And especially when you have people coming up saying, that's a melanoma, you got cancer. And yet I just refused to respond to it. And I didn't do anything different and it's gone and I'm healed and I'm healthy. But most people can't walk based on who they are in the spirit. What they see in the flesh, what they feel is more real to them than the spirit. But I'm telling you, I've gotten to where who I am in Christ is more real to me than what I see or what I feel. And it's a process, but you can do that. You can get to where the spiritual realm is more real. And you know, it has many benefits. I'm now building buildings and doing things and I've gotten to where what I see in my heart is more real to me than what I see with my eyes. I've had so many people tell me, you can't do what you're doing, but I've done it. Amen. Amen. In less than six years, we've spent over $70 million cash without taking out a loan on buildings above my normal expenses. And my more normal expenses are much, much higher than that. And I'm doing things that you can't do in the natural, but I'm doing them because what I see in the spirit is more real to me than my checkbook, than what I see in my wallet, than what I feel in my body, than what people have to say to me. You can get to where you walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. It says that's the normal Christian life. And yet the average Christian is walking by sight and not by faith. You can't see your spirit. 
You have to look in the Word of God and you have to take what the Word of God says because it is spirit and it is life. And that is the real you. Man, that's awesome. And I didn't get very far again. But we went from verse 2 to verse 6. I covered twice as much territory. And, to, and tomorrow morning, I'm going to continue to deal with this. And man, this is powerful stuff. And I know that I apologize in a way because I'm making you think. Most people want to come to church to be entertained or inspired. But man, you need to use your head for something besides a hat rack. You need to think. You need to renew your mind. And that's how you manifest the perfect will of God. Brothers and sisters, you are a new person. Everything you're praying for, you've already got. It's in your spirit. All you have to do is learn how to release it, cooperate with it, not get it. You've already got it. I just happen to have a teaching by that name. You've already got it. So quit trying to get it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you and we are so thankful for the word, so thankful for what Jesus has done for us. And Father, I'm just asking you today that you would speak to people and show them, Father, this, that the Holy Spirit would impress this upon their heart and write it upon their heart so that they wouldn't forget it. Father, give us revelation of this, that people could just walk away from the dominion of the flesh, that sin will not have dominion over them because they are not under the law, but under grace. So Father, we thank you for that. We agree and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.